Boulder Mountain, welcome. If you're a guest here, so glad you've chosen to uh, spend some time with us this morning. I look forward to maybe meeting you after service and get to know you a little bit. A couple notes, just if you call Boulder Mountain Church your home today, a couple business items. Uh, we just hired a worship director, so that's good. It's been a search for a few months, and he and his wife, Isaac and Zoe Ford, will officially begin October 1st. But as many of you know, Emma is being sent out, and we have an opportunity as a church to send a missionary out. And so next Sunday, uh, join us next Sunday as we're, we're going to have a special commissioning opportunity during service, praying over Emma as we, uh, as a church, send her to the mission field. And then Isaac will, and his wife will be joining us uh, shortly. Also, I just want to say a special thank you. One of the opportunities I have here during the week, uh, oftentimes I'm alone sitting in my office. I always invite company to come stop by and say hello. But the last two weeks, I've had a special moment just about every day where I look out the window or I slide open the patio and I hear some people out in the parking lot or they're, they're doing some things. And I just think that's the sweetest picture of the church. Things just need to be done and people show up and do them. From trimming trees, branches that have fallen to sweeping the parking lot in 110 degrees. They're not doing it for recognition. They're not doing it to make a name for themselves. They may never be on stage, but they are significant leaders in the life of the church. And I'm so, there's nothing that makes me more proud than seeing that happen. Even this morning early, people are out trimming trees. And, and so I, if that's you, thank you. Uh, it takes it takes all different gifts. Really, really grateful for those who are who are serving. So we are in the book of Genesis. We've been in the book of Genesis for a few months. Today we're in Genesis 11, and just so you know where we're going, we end the series next week in Genesis 12. So we're not going through the entire book of Genesis, but we're doing a significant part of Genesis. Actually, it's covering just the amount of time that the rest of the Bible covers. Genesis 12 to the end of Revelation covers as much time as Genesis 1 through 11. So there's a lot happening in these first 12 chapters. So we'll end the series next week, and then the Labor Day weekend, we're going to take a moment and just talk about where we're going as a church, give some vision, mission, where we're going as, as a church on Labor Day weekend. So today we're in Genesis chapter 11. And there's really been three strikes. We come to the third strike today in these 11 chapters. And over and over we see just the goodness and the grace of God responding to each one. So the first strike was Adam and Eve in the garden when sin entered the world. The second strike was the flood. Every man, right? Every man did what was evil in their own sight. And that led to the flood that we talked about a couple weeks ago. And this week is the third, the three great events of Genesis 1 through uh, chapter 11. As we look at this passage, let me just share with you a little bit of my journey in ministry. I was called to ministry when I was in high school on a missions trip when I was 16. And God said, I want you to serve me vocationally for the rest of your life. I had no idea what that meant, where I was going to go, school didn't know any of that. I just knew my wife, my life wasn't going to find fulfillment and purpose unless I was obedient, which is always a good, if, if God's called you to do something, do that. It's just good advice. Whatever God's asking you to do that, life will be less complicated. I didn't know what that looked like. So I, I go to school and I start in youth ministry, I took my first church and then over the years, associate pastor and family pastor. And, and every early on in ministry, let me confess to you, I wanted to preach, and so I was at my first church for two years. I, guess what? I never got asked to preach. I thought this was what ministry was. I thought you get up on stage and you, you preach. You give a sermon. That's what God called me to do is to, to preach. Why am I not preaching? Why did nobody ask me to preach? 
go to the next church. Oh, I'm sure they're going to ask me to preach. Now I have some years under my belt. Uh, did he get asked to preach? Maybe one time. Usually it's holidays. It's when the youth pastor gets asked to preach. It's holidays. <laughs> so I got a couple of those. And then over the years, 25 years of ministry, very few opportunities to preach. And what God taught me by his grace is that leadership is not appointed. You don't appoint leadership for yourself. Maybe others in the room have done that in, in your career, in your profession. You've tried to appoint yourself to certain positions. Leadership is best when it's recognized, not appointed. And so over 20 years, I've realized that ministry is sweeping parking lots more than it is on being on stage. If, if you're not willing to sweep parking lots, don't expect to be on stage. If you're not willing to be in the hospital room, don't expect to be invited to give that person's funeral service. And by God's grace, these are things I've learned over the years, but I've had an opportunity to sit with some young pastors, and they're fired up. And they equate ministry to preaching. It's a part of it. Preaching's a, an important part. I'm glad God gave me many, many years and a couple decades to get to the point. And thank you for your patience and grace as I continue to, to learn and grow in this area. But leadership, you don't appoint for yourself. In fact, the best position to take is not the position you apply for, but it's the position somebody invites you to apply for. I don't know if you've experienced that in life. Making a name for yourself rarely goes well. When I was in high school, I remember my coach, I was on a soccer team, talking about not putting the name, our family name, on the back of our jersey. Now, there may be different opinions even in this room. Some coaches, college football teams, for example, the players don't put the name on the back of the jersey. Why? Because you're playing for the team, right? For us, it's helpful because you know who the player is. But for the team, you're not playing for your name. You're not playing for yourself. You're playing for the team. Today, we have an opportunity to talk about what that looks like in our personal life and our relationship with God. Because some of us may be in the room today, and we've been spending a lot of time trying to look good, trying to impress other people trying to climb the ladder of success. And we've thought over the years, if I can just get to that next step, it could be personal. If I could, when I get married, things are going to be so much better. And when I begin to have children, it'll be good. Or maybe it's that position, that job that you want. You get that job and you're okay for six months to a year. And then, you know, I wish I had that other office. And I want that corner office. And over the years, you begin to make it about you. Wanting to be noticed and recognized. When's my time going to come? And we see a really interesting passage today in Genesis 11. Thousands of years ago, the struggles that you and I have, they had then as well. In Genesis 11, we begin coming off of what we looked at last week, coming off of the flood and the bizarre story of Noah getting drunk and naked, right? And if you missed that one, it'll be worth your time to go and, and listen to that. <laughs> Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. There were no language classes back then. Um, there was no foreign language study abroad programs. It was one language, the same words. And as people migrated from the east. So they landed, right? If you remember, in Mount Ararat in Turkey, and then they head east to Iraq. It's kind of, they head south. That's where they're migrating to. And this is the Noah, the great, great, great grandparents of the individuals that we're reading about here. They head east. And they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Shinar is modern day Iraq, um, ancient day Babylon. And what's interesting, already in the first couple of verses, we see they're not doing what they were asked to do. They were asked to multiply, right, and travel, right? Multiply and travel. And 
go, leave, spread out. That don't all go to the same place. People don't like to be told what to do. Can you relate? God's really clear. In Genesis 9, he tells them, the sons of Noah, be fruitful and multiply. Now, after the ark, be fruitful and multiply. Like, what don't you understand? It, leave, it, go. And the same, just a little footnote here today, I'm talking to the church today. The same is true for us. The words God gives to us. Listen, the followers of Jesus move, and I would make the case they move a lot, whatever that looks like. Move. Go. It's, it's the final words Jesus gives to the church. Go. Well, where do we go? Go where, I, go where I'm going to send you. From Isaiah, God calls Isaiah. He says, here am I. Send me. God calls the church to go. The goal is not for us to gather every week and just feel really good and leave and wait till next week. It's to go. And God tells them after the flood, go. I want you to disperse and go. But they do the opposite. They're like, hey, let's hang out together and let's go build something. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitmune for mortar. They're going to use these materials to build something great, something that the world had never seen before. It's actually going to be waterproof. Some commentators believe it's waterproof because they don't want what happened a couple hundred years ago to happen again. What happened a couple hundred years ago? Flood. Let's make this building waterproof, right? And they had brick for stone, bitmune for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves. Lest us, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. It's the exact thing that God told them to do. They were worried about happening. They wanted to stay together. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. Now, let's pause here and just talk about the context. It's really important to understand the context. We talked about this last week. Why would, why would Moses, who's the author of the first five books of the Bible, why would he put that story in last week? And we talked about how important it was for him to include that story of what happened with Noah. Noah, if he was writing, he wouldn't have included that story. But Moses included the story. So Moses is now using, in, in Hebrew literature, in this passage, it's hard for us because it's been translated into English, it's hard for us to understand, but there's poetry, and there's satire, and there's actually sarcasm and cynicism in this text in the original Hebrew. So in a way, Moses is, is mocking them as he writes, as he writes this passage years, years later, as he tells the story. And this is one of the first cases of it. They decide to build a tower that's going to reach up to the heavens, a great and mighty tower. And God, in a, in a passage that another example of the Trinity, come let us, there's a plural word, word there for God, come us, let us go down. It's almost as if God's saying, hey, I know you're making a really big tower, but I can't see it from here. We need to get a little closer. What are they building down there? Do you have my glasses that I can see? We can't see what you're building. Man feels so great. They're building something so great. But God says, let us, let us go down. And anthropomorphism, it's assigning human characteristics to God, saying God's going to come down to see what, what they are building. And then it shows up again. And the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold... They are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, verse 7, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from the cover of the face of all the earth, and they left off the building the city. They stopped where, where they were. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face 
of all the earth. Three things that they wanted. And I don't know if you can relate to any of these. Number one, they wanted a home. They wanted a place that they could call their own. And actually, God had taken care of that in the original, in the Garden of Eden. God gave them a home. And then they wanted, they wanted, what else did they want? They wanted a name for themselves. We, we, we want to be known. We want to be recognized. We want to go viral. Anybody relate to that? I'm just waiting for my big moment to make it really big and have people notice me and to, for someone, even in my office, to say, hey, I, I, I recognize you, I notice you, and you're doing a great job, I'm going to promote you. We're all waiting for that opportunity. And then the last was to be great. They wanted greatness, whatever that looks like. What does that look like for you of those, of those three? God gave, ultimately, when God created mankind, he gave us our ultimate purpose and he met those he met those needs what we see in this passage the building that they're building actually was seven stories tall now we have cruise ships that are twice that size today modern day babel it was called a ziggurat there's evidence of these all throughout that area in mesopotamia and iraq current day iraq but let's call it an idol it's an idol. What are you building in your life that is an idol? What tower are you working on to look really good, to make an, a name for yourself? There's a few things that happen with the idol. When we recognize that our idol is crumbling and falling beneath us. We've all probably been there. We've invested in something, in a career, in, in something to look good, and it's, it's fallen apart. It might even be a relationship. And that relationship has crumbled, and it's fallen apart. And you recognize that it's not working. I need to do something else. There's four things that we can look to. The first is we can blame the idol itself. Well, I just chose wrong. Chose the wrong person. That wasn't my soulmate. We chose the wrong thing. Next time, I'll just choose better. You can blame the idol. You can blame yourself. You can say, I am the problem. I didn't work hard enough. I can try harder and do better. I'm going to turn over a new leaf starting tomorrow morning. I'm going to have a clean desk at the end of the week. Well, that'll last for a few days. The third is you can blame the world. Or the world's out to get me. And you can become cynical and you can become unhappy. You can get numb. You can isolate. You can say, I tried that. I'm going to give up being a happy per person. And then the fourth option is the option I would encourage you to propose and to think about. The fourth option is this. C.S. Lewis says, maybe you and I were made for another world. You and I are created for another world. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satis satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, mankind has been trying to get back to Eden. You see it. Looking for perfection again. This dystopia, this place where we can go and things can be made right and perfect again. You and I were not made for this world and all of its brokenness. And so as we invest in the things of this world, we should not be surprised when they come crumbling down and they fall apart. The things that you and I do on earth today will echo into eternity especially the things that you do to invest in the kingdom of God. I'll, when I was a youth pastor, I would talk to parents, and I didn't know a whole lot about parenting because most of my years as a youth pastor, I didn't have children. It was ca quite comical. Parents would come to me looking for advice for their kids, and I thought I had a lot to tell them. And then years later, I actually have teenagers, and I learned a few things. Well, I didn't. I realized how much I didn't know. 
But one of the things that was really interesting when it came to parenting and things my wife and I have learned over the years is if we, if we climb the ladder of wanting our kids to be successful, what does that look like? Well, we, we want them to be good citizens. We want them to get good grades. It would be great if they went to a good college and got scholarships, maybe even athletic scholarships. And it wouldn't have come from me, but maybe somewhere along the lines, genes got passed down. They got <laughs> really good people so that one day they could have a good family and they could buy a home one day and be good citizens, right? Those are all noble things. Those are all good things. But if that's the ladder that we're trying to parent off of, any one of those can come crumbling down. And often what happens in parenting, as it does in marriage, as it does in careers, we get to the top of the ladder and we realize the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. We get to the end of our life and realize, oh my word, why didn't things become so much clearer? The ladder was up against the wrong wall as opposed to as a parent who's raising their children to do everything we can to create an environment where that child, that son, that daughter would grow up to love Jesus. If your kids, if that ladder is against that wall and they give their life to Jesus and they follow Jesus passionately, those other things will fall into place. The grades, scholarships or lack of scholarships, where they choose to go to school, where God chooses to take them. You trust God on that. Two very different walls. Now let me turn it to you personally. What wall is your ladder leaning up against? Is it a ladder that says, I just want to look good? I'm looking for success. What is success to you? You could even do some homework this week. What, what does success look like to you? What are you investing in with your time, with your talents, the gifts that God's given you? What are you investing in? And then what are you investing in with your finances? Listen, where you put your finances, that's something that will last for eternity if you invest in the kingdom. You and I, I'm going I'm to speak truth to you. You're like, I hope you're always speaking truth to me. <laughs> Just give me a heads up, it's coming. You will be forgotten. There's a day coming you will no longer be here, and you will be completely forgotten. Now, your kids might remember you, and you would hope maybe grandchildren will remember you if God's grace allows you to live that long. But there will be a day where no one on this earth will remember you. Uh, sobering, isn't it? But yet our time is being spent investing in the things of this world. And God says there's a better way. There's another way. It's to invest in, in his kingdom. We see in this passage about making a name for yourself. And there's, we go to the end of the book of Revelation. And I just want to give you a little sneak peek of what happens at the end of Revelation. What's, what's happening in Genesis 1 through 11 really is setting up the whole rest of the Bible. Because next week we're going to talk about the, the agreement that God makes with Abraham that includes you and I. It's pretty cool. It's pretty exciting. We're getting there, Genesis 12. The end of, end of Revelation. I don't know if you know this, but in heaven we wear name tags. And it won't be Glenn. I will not be wearing the name Glenn in heaven. Making, a, making my name great. But we wear the name of Jesus. In fact, that name is written on our foreheads. And the name that you and I carry, greater than the name, your earthly name, is the name of Jesus. For those of you who know Jesus, you bear his name. And the call upon you and I today is not to make your earthly name great, your family great, your business great, Yes, be a great employee. Work hard. Do your absolute best, not unto your boss, but unto who? Unto the Lord who sees you and will reward you in secret and will reward you one day in heaven. 
I often joke with people who are serving around the church, like, hey, thank you. I can, get, I can recognize you here on earth, or you can wait for your reward in heaven. Your choice. Like, oh, I'd rather get what God has for me in heaven. You represent the name of Jesus. And you, you and I, as we go throughout our week, as we go throughout our life, we have an opportunity to make his name famous, to make his name great. This passage here in Genesis 11 didn't catch God off guard. He wasn't surprised and shocked by this. In fact, again, we see the mercy of God. We see the grace of God. God could have wiped them all out again. This didn't catch him off guard. But he, he recognizes that if they continue, if mankind continues to go the way that they're going, they will destroy themselves. Right? Evil will destroy all of us who continue to go down that, that route. So God disperses them and gives them different languages. And I find it interesting, even when I'm speaking the same language, my wife and I don't understand each other. Can anybody else relate? Even when we speak the same language, there can be a whole lot of confusion and misinterpretation. Everything mankind breaks, God is working to repair. All through scripture. Every time mankind begins to turn their back, I mean, this, it wasn't very long again. And they were in the same spot. God, we don't want to be told what to do. I want to do it my way. I want to do it my way. Don't tell me what to do. We're going to figure this out. We're going to e put ourselves on equal plane with God. And he disperses them. He disperses them. A few things as we come to sum this up. Sin will crumble your, your towers at your building. Whatever you're investing in in this world that is of not that is not of God will come crumbling down. The other thing I want to point out, and I referenced it as we were reading the passage, uh, there's a there's a fascinating story. Uh, every world religion has this idea of if I only work harder, if I only build more, if I work harder, do better, strive more, then I will work my way to God. I don't know if you've thought that in, in your life. When things have gone south, you think, I just got to do better. Got to work harder. Got to earn God's love and God's affection. And what's really fascinating, some interpret this passage when it says, come, let us, the Lord came down. Some actually believe this to be Jesus Christ who came down. And you see the word Lord there. But in every world religion, it's all about Working our way to God. Now, I'm, I love to climb mountains. I've climbed a number of mountains. Let me, let me give you a story that David Platt in his book, Radical, tells. He tells a story of what happened when he was standing outside of a Buddhist temple in Indonesia. As he stood there, he got into a conversation with two people, a Buddhist leader and a Muslim leader. Both of them embraced what seemed to be very reasonable belief. They believed that, and maybe you've heard this in conversations you have with friends, while there were superficial differences among the major religions, all of them basically taught the same thing. They were, they were basically ascribing the coexist bumper sticker. Anybody seen those coexist? Hey, we all believe the same thing. We're all going to the same place. We're just different paths to get up to the mountain. God's on the mountain. And so David Platt says, it sounds as though you both picture God at the top of a mountain. It seems as if you believe that we're at the bottom of the mountain. I may take one route up the mountain. You may take another. And in the end, we all end up in the same place. To this, the Buddhists and the Muslims say, yes, exactly. You understand. But then he leaned in and he said, now let me ask you a question. What would you think if I told you that God at the top of the mountain actually came down to where we are? What would you think if I told you that God doesn't wait for the people to find him, but instead he comes to us? That is Christianity. God does not expect us to work our way up the mountain. 
God comes down. And we see that in this text. God comes down. The whole story of Christianity. There's nothing you can do to earn your way to God. There's no amount of good works that will cause you to, for God to love you more than he loves you right now. Again, we get a little sneak peek into, into Revelation. When the day comes in Revelation 7, 9. And you and I are to live life with the end in mind. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before, before the throne and before their lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, saying, Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb. Who are you living for? When you go throughout your day, you go throughout your week, you're trying to look good, you're trying to make a name great for yourself. There's a better way to live. It's, it's a way that Jesus calls us to live, to be crucified to yourself. And rather than climbing the ladder of success, as we follow Jesus, it's the upside down world. Jesus takes everything that, humanly speaking, would make sense to the world, and he flips it upside down. And what does Jesus do? He comes down the ladder. Jesus comes down the ladder. He goes to a cross. Jesus wasn't, even though he was the most powerful person in the room, the night before he goes to the cross. He's washing feet. He's not expecting someone else to wash feet. He's not barking out orders. He takes the form of a servant and he washes feet. What would that look like for you this week? In your role, in the position God's given you. Listen, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, there's a question asked. Should I achieve greatness? I think we've talked about this. Should I pursue greatness? It's a question. And God very clearly says, seek, this is in King James, seek greatness not. Don't seek greatness. It will not end well. God can make you great in worldly eyes. Trust God on that. Do what God's called you to do. Be faithful. Serve. And then trust God with the results. Trust him with what he wants to do with your life. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look at this passage, I'm, I'm convicted. So I confess the times where I've tried to make myself look good. Tried to make a name for myself. I pray you would give us the humility and the courage and the ability to serve without the benefit of, of the applause of mankind. I pray that we would be crucified to ourselves and we'd live life in faith, in faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And so I pray as we close service today, if there's confession that needs to happen, if there's a change in the ladder that we're climbing, the, the, the wall that that ladder is up against, I pray, God, that we would begin to live and make decisions with the end in mind. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. 
If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.